podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones, and we're on episode 106. Gosh, we're climbing up. And for people on the YouTube channel, I want to say, because you'll be watching it, you look very full of energy, uh, Jackie. It's good to see. Yeah, the, the sunlight coming through my window, which makes me always makes me look a bit better. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Bob. <laughs> you're, you're not looking so bad yourself. Oh, yeah. But what yeah. we're going to be talking about this week is the top 10 questions clients ask in therapy. Yes. Now I picked this title. Uh, well, I pick a lot of the titles, but this one. All the titles, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> this one appealed to me, because, in my mind anyway, because I've done quite a few videos over the a long time now, on what therapists ask clients. And if you put that question to Google, I'm sure you're going to get lots of discussions and videos on that. But I rarely see a video or podcast which is discussing what clients um, ask therapists and yeah. what's important for clients to ask therapists. So that's that's why I put this title forward. And uh, I'll kick it off if that's okay. You go for it, Bob. Yeah. I'm going to use the PAC model here, okay. parent, adult, child. And for those people listening and watching, I hope by now you've got the basic model of, you know, transaction analysis. Because I think clients ask questions from different ego states according to where they are in the therapy. Okay. So let's just start off for adult questions, which often at the beginning, of course, um their clinical treatment or 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 sometimes the parent questions which are driven by belief systems or or or, or from the parent ego state uh, i th i think um one of the sort of important questions to ask therapists at the beginning um is things like how long will the therapy continue in your opinion you know yeah. um obviously how, how much does it cost yeah on one one yeah um you know uh have you got qualifications yourself for example i've um, never been asked that bob oh uh, well i have never once been asked if i'm qualified wow um <laughs> wow and you're literally it's surprising isn't it but never never once been asked have you had therapy yourself have i yes no, no, that's a question. All oh, right, oh, that's a question. I was going to say yes, oh, I have. No, no, you have. I think clients, are, it's an interesting question to ask them. Do they have specialisms? Yeah. There's a host of questions that uh, I suggest clients can think about asking. Um, if we talk about ones that I've been asked, let's start with the one you say you've never been asked, <laughs> asked, which is about qualifications. Yeah. So I've been. Seeing clients for, as I say, 37 years, uh, even though I've recently stopped seeing individual clients. And, you know, I'm sort of on your page, really. And, and that is, it, it, it's, um, I could probably count on my hand how many times I've ever, ever been asked that question. Um, now, interestingly, again, of course, um, if we, if the therapy counselling profession ever gets licensed by the government with some sort of licensing you would actually get a license number yeah so when the client came in they'd see a nice little plaque or something, or something yeah. like that. so if you want to see an osteopath for example where that profession is regulated that's what you would see yeah um so you know clients will, will see that and might be sued by that or not um i was interested when you said you've never been asked that though no, never. So, no. what's that about? Do you think? Do you think that clients just assume because of some sort of magical reason that you're qualified, or are you going to say that it's because the clients have become because they've been recommended? Or I honestly don't know. I I, I don't know whether it's the term psychotherapist just gives an air of. 
qualification. I don't know whether if I was a counsellor or a coach or I, I don't know. I don't know whether it's the title. Oh, but no, I've never, never once been asked if I'm qualified or how long I've been qualified or anything or what type of psychotherapist I am. Wow, that's, that's a, an amazing uh, sentence construction. I think it's useful for clients to perhaps certainly ask the second question, um, you know, what sort of model of psychotherapist you come from, which I have been asked quite a lot of time, far more than am I qualified. Um, no, it's, it's me that volunteers that and then talks a little bit about it. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, no, never been asked. It's also an interesting, when I trained people to be psychotherapists, we used to have a weekend on marketing yourself. And um, people who, who have got, say, MAs or PhDs from other disciplines um, often ask the question, shall I put, put ownership, those not in the psychotherapy world, my doctorship, for example. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's in the same ballpark. Do you put your photograph onto websites if you're advertising your own services, for example. And I've got the same answer for both. And it's to do with transference and projections. So actually, uh, for some people, if you put PhD or even a doctor on your website or your card, it may frighten them off. Mm. Especially if they've got a, some sort of projections about academia. Yeah. And for some other people, it might suit them. And it's the same with photographs. People is in the world of projections again. People might like your photograph. Other people might, oh, that reminds me of my, of my aunt or my first girlfriend or or whatever. Oh, yeah, I, I, I love the way that you say that because it's something that never, never crossed my mind until we had this discussion a long time ago. I'm not even sure whether you remember it because I put my picture on my business card. Uh, and oh. you were like, why have you put your picture on your business cards? And you said all of this. For me, I was doing it because of my own personal feelings that I would like to see who's going to open the door. Oh. Oh. If I didn't have a, a vision of who it was, I probably wouldn't go to them. So, yeah, and I connect with people visually. Oh. So but I wasn't I... looking at it from the client's point of view. I was looking at it from my own point of view. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, those questions. Um, so around qualifications, rarely have I been asked that. Um, in fact, you're quite right. I have, I know, but it's usually around UKCP. Are you you are you UKCP regulated? Now, I don't have cards. Can you believe it or not? Um, when I sort of started off, I must have had cards and I must have advertised, but. Um, it would say on there whether I was UKCP accredited or not. Yeah. But if they came through recommendation, they might ask me that question. I think it's useful to think about those terms in terms of protection. Yeah. Or a client. Yeah. Uh, to to ask that. I mean, invariably, you know, <clears throat> the major question that a client would ask me, and I'd be interested in when I ask the question to you. Um, the major question is, um, or even if it's not answered from the adult, it's certainly answered for, asked from the child, is how long, you know, can it, you know, is, is it fixable? Am I fixable? Yeah. Can I be cured? How yeah. long will it take? Those sorts of questions, and usually from the child eager state. Yeah, I've been asked that, how long does it last? Oh, and, oh. and not just the session how how long will i need to come for oh, oh. before i'm fixed <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's the bit that might not be saved before i'm fixed and it's usually a question from a child i think yeah um it can be a course from the adult and in the same vein and now with the sort of economic climate that we live in even more prevalent um when people might say is it okay for me to come fortnightly do i have to always come weekly for example yeah and i understand that very much in the economic climate we live in and different therapists might have different answers to that yeah for example i mean i'm quite clear on that and that actually i say back well i under is it for economic reasons and if it is which it usually is 
I don't. Sorry, this is why I tell therapists with this discussion rather than I see them now. But if it is, um, I'll say I understand that. However, therapy will take longer if you go fortnightly. Mm. And for lots of reasons. Because if you go fortnightly, which is 14 days, which is a long time, by the it way. It is a long about, time, yeah. Hold your anxiety and everything else. Um, the first part of that session will probably be the, th the therapist catching up with you and what you'll be doing for 14 days. Um, mm. Secondly, your psychological defense systems um, will go have longer to go up. So in other words, you know, for them to start coming down again or that level of vulnerability to be around, um, the therapist, uh, it will take longer. Yeah. So I was always intrigued by that. Um, but I, I was also intrigued by psychoanalysts that wanted to see clients three times a week. And I... Uh, I asked a few psychoanalysts why, and I eventually found a book on ego, called Ego State Therapy, which gave me a, a, a reason I really understood, and that is the longer that you wait from session to session, so if you waited a week or two weeks, then it gives more time for the psychological defences that you have to come up again. The shorter you leave it, the more you're vulnerable and open you are, a psychological query it does make sense but three times a week is a bit excessive well it's interesting isn't it because i mean i'm not an advocate of psychoanalysts as you know particularly so you know i think it's very expensive and it goes on for a long time but in terms of work with people's defense systems when i run psychotherapy marathons for example mm -hmm. i used to over five days and over three days and i still do some three-day ones um they're, they're much more vulnerable and open because it's the next day. Yeah, I've done a three-day one with you, and yeah, I, I I do understand that. But that's like a, a one-off, or it, it, do you know what I mean? But to do that, you know, oh. all the time. But that's the reasoning I read in the book, and that's the reasoning probably a psychoanalyst, if they were talking to another, might, might well say, for example. No, I usually say to clients that we agree to do four weekly to start off with and then we'll reassess it after four weeks so they come every week for four weeks and then we can chat and discuss it and some will do that four weeks and then go away and you know they're, they're fine with it and other ones will continue every week or we might do it once a fortnight after that but i do agree it does give them more time to put the defenses up mm. and the, the beginning of the next session usually 10 or 15 minutes is just catching up on what's happened over the last fortnight so I, I totally agree with what you were saying yeah yeah and psychotherapy will take longer yeah so actually be, financially it becomes counterproductive yeah however i have i said all that i do understand in that question and that process in the times that we live in now yeah um but yeah one of the questions uh, qualifications another one is you know about you know is it weekly is it fortnightly another one how long will it take and in brackets before i'm fixed yes um what questions did you see on google then really um one of them was you know how can i manage my symptoms outside of therapy or what happens outside of therapy Oh, right. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So that, that's sort of from the, well, it could be from the adult again, but it could also be from the child, basically saying things like from the child, you will take care of me, you will look out for me, you will account for me. Yeah. But it's all in the ballpark, really, isn't it? Um, the question, which is, will there be a plan? Yes. Yeah. Is there a, is the homework I'll have to do. Yeah. So I went to see, a, I started Pilates not recently, well, fairly recently ago. And um, that's a question I asked her, actually, which was, will I have to do homework? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, we'll get to know you first. And then yes, basically. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's a physical therapy, isn't it? Um, so psychologically, I think, it's a good question. It's like, will I will I have to do homework? Is there is there a plan for me? Um, are there things I have to read? These are yeah. questions that often will appear. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I suppose in the first session I have with clients, I kind of preempt a lot of these questions and stay a lot, you know, before they even ask the question. But one of one of the things is about how confidential is therapy? Oh, I don't, that is a common question. Yeah. yeah. it's it, uh, And I think it's a very protective question for a client to ask. Yeah. So you so I would imagine uh you know the therapist might have that in their heads to say before the client says it but um I think if the clients don't hear the therapist say that they need to check it up yeah but that that is something that I say right from the get go do you know what I mean mm. um and I usually phrase it as <laughs> Unless I think that you're going to harm yourself or harm somebody else. Mm. So put yourself at risk or put somebody else at risk. You know, the, the, I, I won't speak to anybody other than my supervisor who I, I do share things with. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. So these are the questions up here. Uh, and um, I think they're important questions often from the adult eager state or child eager state. But then I think there's often a lot of questions which come transferentially yeah from the child uh and, and those are they're, they're, they're different really and one sections of questions which i have to think about a lot but comes regularly if you're doing any child ego state work and that's personal questions about the therapist mm. now it's the child's desire often through idealization or often through the search for security, the search for soothing, may ask personal questions of the client's life or home life, um, you know, out of curiosity, out of many different um, areas. And I always have to think carefully before I ask, answer those, mm -hmm. actually, um, because there's certain certain types of clients I would hesitate being too personal with yeah does that make sense to you Absolutely. I mean I don't know if you have those sorts of questions um yeah I have have been asked certain questions and it's like I can remember as part of our training we did I don't know whether it was a day or an afternoon on how our therapy room should be set up do you know what I mean? I, I don't know whether people on YouTube will be able to see behind. There's, there's a picture on my wall that is of my son, but it, it's, it, it just looks like a picture. Nobody can identify <coughs> my son. But about not having anything personal in the room, so no family pictures or, you know, anything that can be offensive in any way. So it's, it's quite neutral and bland oh. in there. You know, like at Christmas, I'm really conscious of not putting Christmas decorations up. Well, that's all to do with projections, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All that sort of stuff. I, I think the child desire out of curiosity, I understand that, that from an almost a sense of normal normalness. However, you know, if you've got a fairly disturbed client, then I don't think it's healthy, particularly for the therapist to go into a lengthy discussion about where they live and what the house is like and yeah. their, their pets, their dogs, their wife, their girlfriends or whatever it is, or they go running every morning or they eat cornflakes instead of porridge or they like this or they like that. I mean, I think that's a dangerous and even maybe unhealthy road to go down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, you know, for some people, I would imagine it's a way of connecting, but just being polite and asking certain questions but it's how much you divulge of your life personally yeah absolutely and i suggest not much yeah no the therapist how, how can i explain this therapy is not about clients and therapists necessarily being friends no it might be might be an arena where there's friendliness around between the two people yeah, it's not about you know the client being friends with the therapist or even the therapist being friends with the client. That's a different process. That's why I said the questions, the desire for connections, comes from the child ego state. I think. Yeah. Especially if you work transferentially. Yeah. 
yeah i do i do agree and there, there is you know it there is a fine line in you know having the therapeutic relationship and it becoming very familiar mm. with clients and i do feel uncomfortable with that there's a definite line for me yeah and i think that needs to be thought about like contact outside of therapy do you know what i mean unless it's organized you know, if they want to cancel or postpone or or something like that, that's fine. But you know, I make a, a point of not having contact with clients by, via messages in between sessions. I, I agree with all these professional boundaries, and uh, and when I was thinking of the title of the questions that clients would ask, it is I think important to differentiate between the client, the questions that clients ask from their child. And their adult and parent. Yeah. Yeah, because the, you, the the conversations and the answers can be misconstrued if they're coming from a child point of view. Do, do you know what I mean? And also, if you're going down that road, then you know they can feel abandoned or do you know what I mean? Disappointed and all those sort of things. If it's coming from an adult to adult and it's a conversation, then that's fine. But if they're coming at it from a a, a child's place yeah things can be misunderstood a lot more I think and to be fair clients are in that child's place a lot in the therapy room yeah so you think yeah. you think when you share information of yourself in response to those quite intimate questions or yeah questions, then I think the therapist needs to reflect on that yeah and uh, I also looked at some questions on Google. Oh, go on. What have you got? The admin questions were. Um, so number one was around how long have you practised? Secondly, and I've, I don't think, now you talk about a question about qualifications. I don't think I've ever been asked that. No. You know, I've never... Think now that doesn't mean it's not a question you might not ask out of protectiveness. Uh, as I say, number two, what is your training and certification? Uh, I don't know how often I've been asked that. I have been asked, are you a TA therapist, humanistic therapist, relational therapist? Um, However, most clients don't understand the difference anyway. No, but, uh, but I have been asked that. Um, what therapeutic approaches do you use? And are they right for my issues? N not never been asked that either. No. Uh, what would be your suggested plan for me? Are you registered? Well, we've just talked about that. Have you worked with others with a similar issue background to me? Well, I've been asked that. Have you worked with trauma? Have you worked with sexual abuse, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yeah, I think I've been asked if I work with certain people. Yeah. I've never been asked the next one. Do you have supervision? no that's uh, an interesting one i have been asked in a way have you attended therapy yourself i've often been asked do i offer a sliding scale by the way but that's an admin sort of question in my yeah. i've often been asked do i offer skype sessions or zoom therapy and all that uh, i've never been asked what were your reasons for being a therapist uh never been asked that I have been asked, what's your policies around insurance, cancellation, payment, uh, things like that. So that's why I say, I think they come from different ego states. Yeah. A lot of that is in my contract. Do you know what I mean? About cancellation policies and the, the, the admin sort of stuff. One of the things that came up when I asked this question was, what can I expect from therapy? Which I thought was quite a, an interesting question. Yeah. Now, if had that's been asked... That's been asked, and my response to that response usually to that is, well, what would you? What's your expectations of therapy? Yeah. Now, people listening to this might be that's me giving back the question to the client, yeah, doing a typical <laughs> psychotherapy thing. <laughs> you know, um, but you know, it's interesting because is cure the expectation for clients? I bet you, when you if you did say that back. They'd probably say just to be, I don't know, I haven't been asked it actually, just to have a more healthy, you know, life or be more contented, yeah. or less depressed or 
Again, uh, I have that on my contract. It says, what are you hoping to get from therapy? And usually people put, to be happier. Yeah, which is very yeah. odd. And then yeah. you have to, have to say, what do you mean by happier? Well, what, what I usually say to them is, I will win or when you get there. <laughs> what would that look like? <laughs> yeah. Again, in the transference, of course, um, the next question I'm going to ask can be said from adult or child, which is, you know, how will I know when therapy's ended? Yeah. Now, well, how will, do we end it? Yeah. Yeah. EA world's a bit more simpler to answer because it's contractual. Yes. Yeah. Could be at one level when we've achieved the contract or the goals or whatever yeah. that is. Um, but again, I still think uh, the questions that come from the younger child are usually around the desire for contact. Um, another way of looking at questions, by the way, is is if you see therapeutically or therapy the way that I see therapy, and that's developmental. And the idea that you know people will enact out their script or their, their early decisions in the therapy room. So so the clues to what some people may um, ask of the therapist will will come from how you know their relationship with their significant other people. Yeah. So they then project onto the therapist and they may ask queries, questions accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't think, you know, in the first session when I'm seeing a client for the first time, that they they ask an awful lot of questions, really. I think maybe it comes over time that they'll ask questions. I usually have a phone call with them first, a 10 minute telephone conversation where they might ask some questions in that. But yeah, it's interesting. Well, yeah. And, and I think from a parent place, it's, it made me think should clients be asking more questions, particularly at the beginning of therapy? Mm. And I think that will, that will really be replicate their relationship with their significant caretakers that they had in their childhood. I was thinking in terms of in terms of protection, for example. Yeah. So the self. Yeah. But the sort of questions a ten year old will ask and a thirteen year old will ask and a seven year old will ask are very different from perhaps when the person's in their adult ego state asking questions from the age they are actually absolutely yeah yeah i think one that i do get asked quite a lot throughout you know the therapy is is that normal <laughs> is what i'm doing normal people often want some sort of reassurance that i've seen it before or is is it normal behavior mm -hmm. yeah and you're right, I, I, I might get that. And my response is usually around an attempt to normalise what they think, because underneath that question is usually the fear that they're eccentric, odd, yeah. crazy, on that, on that sort of level. Yeah. That's the way perhaps their history is, or people around them have defined them yeah it's been strange or different or yeah that's what i'm saying so the questions from the child ego state i think are different as the therapy goes on especially if you work transferentially and developmentally like me than often the adult questions at the beginning yeah uh, what is really important though is that as the relationship develops from a trust place and are building the rapport up with the client that the more the client trusts the therapist there's more of a field opening up for the client to be able to ask the queries and questions they never felt they were able to ask either in their history um, or in fact in present day yeah yeah and again, yeah, I, I know maybe I bring this up quite a lot in the podcast is that 
you know, fear of being asked certain questions. I I probably felt that an awful lot in the early days of practicing, whereas now mm. I'm quite open to answer any questions. Do you know what I mean? It's like when you were saying about where you live and what's your house like. I work from home, so people usually know where I live oh, and they know the type of house that I have. So there's certain questions that, do you know what I mean, I, I don't need to answer. But I can remember feeling like I needed a backlog of answers just in case I was asked all this in the early days, whereas now I'm I'm quite open to having a conversation with, with clients. Yeah, I think experience comes into this a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And through experience, you will <clears throat> know the red flags. Yeah. Because there are red flags. Yeah, yeah. And it's usually around levels of intimacy. Yeah. And it's usually around the fact they weren't able to have that intimate, connected relationship, which they, which they should have had, really, with their, you know, significant caretakers. Yeah. They, it, their desire for a different outcome then often gets enacted out transferentially with the therapist. Yeah. And I think the therapist system really needs to be aware of red flags uh, be in this sort of area because um, too much personal information divulged isn't always helpful. No, no. The therapist. Totally agree, yeah. And, you know, trust your intuition as well. Do you know what I mean? If it feels wrong, then it probably is. That's a good one. That's a good good, yeah. good, good thing to follow. Um, so, so questions you are, as I said, I think they come from different ego states. And, you know, it's many of the admin ones around price and cost and, can we go fortnightly? Can we go all those ones we talked about earlier in the podcast? I understand. I like you. Don't have many questions about qualifications and you know, do have you studied transaction analysis or gestalt psychotherapy or person centered? Maybe if the person's already a therapist, a counselor, they might ask that question, but it's rare. Yeah. It might be because most people find me through my website, and that information is already on my website. So the do you know what I mean? They don't need to ask the question. Yeah. But as you go on in therapy, I think the therapies, uh, sorry, go on in therapy, the questions often come from, you know, the younger developmental ages that you're working with um, than the adult. Yeah. I, by the way, always encourage people to um, make the careers in questions if you want to put it that way the increased dialogue with me because often i'm working with people who have been neglected or withdrawn or been overdefined, and they've never been allowed to have that natural expression mm. significant others there should be a an example of a healthy dialogue yeah which they never were allowed it's that yeah. fine line you just talked about in terms of red flags between over familiarity, identification, and uh, that road, which yeah, I think the therapist needs to think about carefully. Yeah, I think so too. And, and you then, know, ultimately, well, our own safety has to be a priority. And and if you are getting, you know, that feeling or that red flag, then you need to prioritise your own safety. Particularly if you're working like me, do you know what I mean, from your home on your own at times and things like that, you, you need to, to be mindful. Yeah, because the, the, oh, definitely, definitely that area, what you've just talked about there, you have to be yeah. very mindful. I mean, another question I have, I have asked, me far more than am I qualified and where what model I do work from is from the very younger self of the client is things like do you love me wow or are you always going to be thinking about me do you think about me at home do you care about me and will you be always there for me because it's it's the younger child that 
that desperately needs that sort of a relationship they never had. Yeah. So you've been asked that many times, and they're different types of questions. It's like the girl or the boy asking the dad or the mum. Yeah. But I work at that level developmentally and transferentially, or I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I look at look at those questions through a relational field, and think, uh, and 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 of course understand that from the three year old or the seven year old or the nine year old, and the desire to have a different outcome and to have a different inaction to to get some healing. So, how would you answer that question then? Which one? <laughs> do you do you love me? Do you think about me in between sessions or whatever? Because I I would I would find it hard then to keep that that boundary. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't want my clients to think that I thought about them all the time outside of the therapy room or or anything. Well, I invariably go back to the history. So I, somebody said to me, "Do you think about me from session to session?" I would say. And is this what you desired such a long time ago and didn't get with your parents? Somebody would be there consistently, have a level of dependability, look out for you as healthy parents should. Are you saying to me in code that this is what you desired for and never had? So you wouldn't actually answer the question then? <laughs> uh, well, it's... Well, I am, Jackie, because the question has come from a developmental perspective. So the question has come from the younger self, the nine-year-old, the trauma traumatised self. So I'm going back there to answer it. Yeah. I'm answer it, answering it from where the trauma was, not like to... In here and now, an adult, twenty-two-year-old and a twenty-year-old, because that's a. That, <laughs> it's not like a adult-to-adult -adult question. Yeah. It's from the traumatic child to the, to the, 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 the person they wanted to be so different. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. So I'm not answering it from the real time, because psychological time and real time are two very different things. I want to go back to answer it in a way that the injured child desired. Yeah. They didn't get, in other words. Yeah. And that's yeah. a really good way of explaining it. Do you know what I mean? The psychological time is different to real time. Yeah. Very different. I mean, yeah. you know yourself on a completely another level. You've been there for a very long time. That no, re healing doesn't really take place in the adult to adult world no because that's past timing yeah yeah absolutely oh, yeah. yeah you know the healing takes place in the child ego state now yeah. it depends how as a therapist it will depend of course if you're a developmental transferential therapist in other words you go back quite a long way and you work with the you know deep-seated trauma and everything else that goes with that that might be different from a cbt therapist who might say well i i'm mainly working with the adult ego state i don't necessarily agree with that by the way jackie i think the child's always there but um they're two different types styles of therapists aren't they yeah yeah and you're somebody I think, anyway, because you trained in the, in the way I'm talking about, do you will enter dialogue with the child? I think I'm right, aren't I? Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, it, it does become apparent in sessions when they, they're looking for recognition and validation and, and those sort of things from that very young place, yeah, which an adult wouldn't do in any other situation, really. And what you're doing is giving a response back, which is developmentally... Aim now. In other words, it's a it's the, the transaction going back is with an awareness that the person in front of you is coming from a different developmental space. Yeah. And therefore the response is aimed back in that time and period in terms of healing, 
rather than the adult space and time. Yeah. So there's lots of questions that we get asked. From many different ego states. From many different ego <laughs> states, yeah. And it, it, it's good. It's good It's good that we've had this conversation. That you, do you know what I mean? Just to let people know that there are different questions, whether, like you say, it's the contractual questions, whether it's the logistics or, or whether it goes much deeper than that. Absolutely. And in TA, we're analysing transactions uh, there's a stimulus and there's a response. Yeah. And the stimulus and the response need to be thought of in terms of, I think, age. In other words, is the stimulus stimulus coming from the adult ego state in the here and now, appropriate to the age they are? Or is the stimulus I stroke question coming from a different developmental space? Because that will determine a different transaction back again or a different response back again. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? It's very interesting, Bob. Yeah. You look Thank at you it. I think as TA therapists, we have an advantage in thinking about it that way. Because yeah. I would be very surprised that when clients come in your room, you do not think, oh, or almost automatically, which ego state does that transaction come from? Yeah. Somewhere, you probably might not explicitly language it like that, but I think you were trained that way, so I bet you subconsciously uh, that influences your therapy. Yeah, yeah. Like you say, it's not a conscious thing, but I'm aware, I'm aware of the, the changes and the shifts that occur, yeah. And, and that's the hallmark of your, you know, your, you as a therapist. So the questions are just the same. Does the question come from the adult does it come from a child does it come from a parent and then the response back from you will meet that ego state yeah yeah it it, it comes into all sorts the the pack system i use that an awful lot you know as a, an educative thing and a learning thing back from the start and all the way through yeah i think we, i think being trained as transactional analysts, I, I, I was always fortunate that way because uh, I, I, I was, I'll say, you know, through my training, I was trained to think about which ego states, the transactions, what stroke questions in this podcast that we're talking about come from, because that will determine my response. Yeah. It's really helpful with couples counselling as well. I use it an awful lot in couples so that they can work out, do you know what I mean, why sometimes they're arguing and, and the cross transactions and all that sort of stuff. And it's well, really, yeah. really useful, I yeah. think. Yeah. Well, basically in couples counselling, I know we're coming past the end of the podcast, but I want to say in couples counselling, the questions that come from both the clients in couples questions is quite a lot about you being a the parent and you being the mediator mm. <laughs> so the question is aimed at yeah. you giving a favorable um response back again yeah yeah it's interesting so bob thank you until next time where we will be discussing the nice therapist phenomena in the therapy room oh people pleasers yes, yes. <laughs> interesting Okie dokie, until next time, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.